Hello and welcome to the third reading um, today for the official release um, Facebook event of um, my book of short dark tales called A Dark Assortment, which is available on Amazon all around the world exclusively, I dare say. Yes, indeed. Think of that. So um, I've done a couple of these already and I'm going to read a slightly longer one now. I'm going to record this as live, so I am going through this, even though it's a longer story. If, if I goof it up, I'm just going to keep going. So um, bear with me. Pretend almost as if you're in the room with me. And of course, you'll be very welcome to. There isn't much room in here, but, uh, you know, you could not come up once because I haven't got enough biscuits or cookies or whatever you want to call them. OK, so <clears throat> this story is called simply Safety. Everyone knew about the escaped prisoner. He was armed, they said. He was dangerous, an Islamic extremist, a suspected terrorist. Police patrolled the streets in pairs, their fingers resting on the trigger guards of their submachine guns. At ten years old, Mark was easily big enough to walk home from school on his own, but his teacher had given him a stern talk about keeping off the streets and going straight home. It was all very exciting. But what Mark really liked was the police helicopter. From the landing that led to their flat on the top floor, you could watch the blue and yellow helicopter circling over the city. Sometimes it swooped low and hovered like a hawk homing in on its prey. And at night, if Mark crept out onto the landing and switched the lights off, he could pick out the helicopter's distinctive port and starboard lights. Then he could easily spend an hour tracking the helicopter's path as it wove through the night and soared above the sleeping streets. And occasionally, if he was lucky, the helicopter's searchlight would cut down through the darkness, seeking out its target. It was better than TV. But on this night a vicious storm hurled cold rain hard against the window and Mark couldn't see a thing. He sighed. There was nothing he could do but hope the weather would clear. He hadn't even seen the helicopter yet. But perhaps that was something to do with the vivid streaks of lightning that every now and then surged from the street light tinged clouds to split the sky in two. Mark screwed up his eyes in concentration and tried to stare out through the rain-blurred glass. Will the helicopter even be out there in this weather? he wondered. Surely it would be too dangerous. And if they are flying, I bet they can't see a thing in this weather. He nodded to himself. Even their special thermal cameras were no match for this downpour. Mark scratched his chin and yawned. He would give it another half hour. Perhaps something good might happen by then. Something exciting. Something to brighten up his dull evening. Twenty-five minutes later, a door slammed, the noise echoing up the empty stairwell. Mark frowned. It happened all the time. Someone staggering home from the pub, drunk, clumsy and careless. Quietly, Mark crossed the landing and leaned over the railing. That's weird, he thought. The whole stairwell was in darkness, and that never happened. At night there was always a glow from the wall lights. They were even meant to work in an emergency. True, a few of them were usually broken, so one or two landings were always gloomy. But the stairwell was never completely dark. Not like this. Mark stared down into the bottomless blackness, his face twisting in fear. In the daylight, the long drop down the centre of the stairwell didn't bother him. But this was creepy. It made his stomach squirm. He took a breath and started to turn away. But as he moved, he glimpsed something from the corner of his eye. He hesitated and looked down, and suddenly... He knew for certain he was not alone. 
Far below him, perhaps near the ground floor, a thin beam of light danced crazily across the stairwell. Mark held his breath. Someone was definitely down there. Heavy footsteps grated against the rough concrete steps as somebody shuffled upwards. Or were they going down the stairs? Mark tilted his head and listened, but he couldn't make sense of the echoes. He stood still and watched the drunken beam of light. Yes, it was getting closer. However it was, they were climbing the stairs, coming toward him. The hairs on the back of Mark's neck stood on end. Who was it? What did they want? And seriously, why weren't the emergency lights on? <clears throat> Mark left the railing and felt along the wall for the light switch. He clicked the switch once. Twice. But the landing light wasn't working. They've cut the power, he thought. He'd seen it in movies. When the police knew where the suspect was, they'd cut the lights to confuse him. And then they'd move in, special teams pounding up the stairs, kicking in the doors, scanning every room with their night vision goggles. Unless... The terrorist has cut the power. He'd do that if he wanted to seize control of the building and take hostages. Mark swallowed hard. What the hell should he do? And then he heard something that sent a sharp stab of fear to pierce his stomach. Below him in the darkness, someone stumbled and crashed into the metal railing. And when they let out a curse, the harsh words were foreign. It was the prisoner. Mark's eyes went wide and the floor swayed beneath his feet. He clamped his hand over his mouth to keep them crying out. He mustn't make a sound. His life depended on it. Slowly, he took a shaky breath. At least now he knew what he had to do. Mark crept across the landing and opened the door to his flat, easing the door handle down slowly so that it wouldn't squeak. Inside, he didn't try the lights. There wasn't any point. He headed straight for his bedroom without hesitation, without even pausing outside his parents' bedroom. He'd explain everything later, but at that moment, every second counted. He had to make a call, and his phone was in his bedroom. He crept into his room and grabbed his phone, his fingers moving quickly over the screen. The call took forever to connect. Yes, he said. I've seen the escaped prisoner. The one on TV and the radio. Yes, I'm sure. Come quickly. He's got a gun. No, I don't know what sort. Just come quickly. He's coming up the stairs. I, I think he saw me. The operator told him to calm down and give his address. Mark even gave her his postcode. But when she asked him to stay on the line, he shook his head and put his phone on the bedside table. No, he murmured. He sat on his bed and pulled his knees up to his chest. He stared into space. Please, he whispered into the darkness. Please come quickly. Mark sat still and listened to the hoarse rasp of his breathing. It was too fast, too shallow to do him any good, but he couldn't make it slow down, couldn't stop himself from shaking. We'll be all right, he told himself. As long as they come soon, we'll all be safe. And suddenly, the silence was sliced open by a barrage of sound. The dull, thudding clatter of helicopter blades was so close that the sound battered against Mark's bedroom window like a giant's fist hammering on the glass. The deafening vibrations pounded through his skull and resonated in his chest. He put his hands over his ears, but it didn't make any difference. Help! he shouted. The searchlight flashed across his window, footsteps in the hall, outside his room. His bedroom door burst open. Mark shut his eyes and screamed, and someone shouted his name. Mark, what the hell is going on? Mark opened his eyes. His dad stood wild-eyed in the doorway, a flashlight in his hand. Mark, are you all right? he said. But he didn't wait for an answer. He crossed the room, wrapped his arms around his sobbing son and rubbed his back. Did the helicopter scare you? Mark held on to his dad, clutching tight handfuls of his warm T-shirt. 
They're coming, Dad. I'll be here soon. His dad sighed. No, no, he said. It's just a dream. Just a bad dream. It's that stupid helicopter flying too low again. It's nothing to worry about. Mark pressed his head against his dad's chest. And then, between his sobs, he told his dad everything. Outside, the officer in charge gave the word and two teams of four CO-19 specialist firearms officers snaked into the building. Team two, led as always by Sergeant Bentley, raced up the stairs. They were tasked with securing the stairwell. Team one began checking the ground floor. Bentley leaped up the stairs, his team hard on his heels. They held their weapons ready, ready for anything. In moments, they had the suspect in their sights. They'd all trained for this. They knew exactly what to do. Their orders had been very clear. Armed police! Bentley shouted. Do not move! Majid Nasser didn't know why the lights had gone out. But he did have a flashlight. He liked to keep it by his bed. It was a large black flashlight, the kind with a long metal body. He'd bought it from a market stall. Was five British pounds a lot of money to pay for such a thing? He didn't think so. And anyway, it was about to come in very useful. He switched it on and let himself out of the flat and onto the landing. Perhaps he could find someone to ask what was going on. He might even be able to make himself useful. After all, back in Syria, he'd been a qualified mechanical engineer. He knew a thing or two about getting machines to work. Must be some sort of master switch or circuit breaker, he muttered. It would probably be hidden away somewhere, but he couldn't just go poking around without permission. He needed to check. He needed to find someone. The landing was empty. Maybe he could ask a neighbour for help. He frowned. His English was not good. He'd been taking classes for a month, but it wasn't easy. He'd always favoured good solid numbers rather than slippery words. Still, this would be a good opportunity to try out his skills. He shone his flashlight across the landing that he shared with five other flats. He'd often passed his neighbours in the stairwell, but they'd never returned his smiles. He tried each door in turn, knocking politely and stepping back to wait, but no one answered. He'd have to try again on another floor. As he let himself out onto the stairwell, the heavy fire door slipped from his hand and slammed behind him. He grimaced. The noise would not endear him to his neighbours. But he had a job to do. He must press on. His flashlight was bright, but it did little to puncture the stairwell's darkness. He climbed the stairs slowly, his flashlight's beam sending shadows slinking across the concrete wall. It was eerie disorienting. It was as if he was standing still and the stairs were gradually sinking into the darkness below. But what choice did he have? Majid took a breath and pressed on, but as he watched the shadows he missed his step and stumbled, cracking his knee against the metal railing. Bending forward to rub his injured leg he dropped his flashlight and the stairwell plunged into darkness. He bent lower and ran his fingers over the filthy floor. There, his fingers brushed against the flashlight's smooth metal and he grabbed it. As he stood up, he tried the switch, but the flashlight was broken. Majid should have known it was cheap rubbish the moment he laid eyes on it. Cheated again. Blood rushed to his cheeks and he uttered some words that his wife would not have approved of. My wife, he thought, my lovely wife. He sighed and stood alone in the darkness. Safia, he whispered. He closed his eyes and allowed himself to picture her smile, letting out a deep breath as he leaned against the metal railing for support. She'd been so beautiful, so warm. What would she make of him now, creeping up the stinking concrete staircase with graffiti on the walls? My poor Safia, he said. They'd visited the wrong house one day. That was all. Just a quiet meal shared with an old friend. 
a friend, it turned out, with the wrong connections. But Majid hadn't known that. It wasn't a clandestine meeting like the authorities had said afterwards. They'd done nothing wrong, nothing even remotely suspicious. But that simple fact hadn't stopped the police from storming into their home in the middle of the night. It hadn't stopped the beating, the humiliation, the torture. Majid shook his head. It was sheer luck that he had a contact, an uncle who had some influence with the regime. Eventually the police were persuaded to let him go, but his joy was short-lived. Their release orders came too late for Safiya. There'd been no explanation, no word of apology, but Majid had known he'd never see her again. His uncle told him to get out of the country. And why not? There was nothing left for him in Syria, no reason to stay. So he'd let himself be persuaded. His uncle assured him he'd be granted asylum in the UK. It was the only way to survive, he'd said. In the UK, Majid would be safe. Mark's dad switched off his flashlight and crept out onto the landing. What the hell am I doing? He should have stayed in the flat, bolted the door and kept his family safe. But he couldn't do that. Mark had an overactive imagination. He'd always been that way. Now with the storm and the helicopter and the tension over the escaped prisoner, he'd got himself overexcited and made a mistake. It must be a mistake, mustn't it? A dreadful mistake. I've got to sort this out, he thought, before someone gets hurt. He shuddered. If someone was hurt, then Mark would be to blame. He couldn't let a stupid mistake destroy his son's childhood. He couldn't stand by and let someone's blood be on Mark's hands. But what could he do? His only plan so far was to peer into the stairwell and, if it seemed safe, shout out to whoever was down there. If it was just one of his neighbours, perhaps he could warn them to get out of the way before the police arrived. Suddenly, there was an explosion of echoes, the boom of slammed doors, the ominous rumble of heavy boots. He stopped, frozen on the edge of the landing, and stared down into the stairwell's black void. What the hell am I doing here? And then the darkness was carved apart, sliced open by a wavering array of bright beams. They flew along the walls, then picked out a dark dark shape, the shape of a man, and honed in. A barrage of rough voices yelled a chorus of commands. Mark's dad opened his mouth to shout, and in that moment the power surge protection relays recovered from the direct lightning strike and automatically reset. There was a sudden flash, and the stairwell was bathed in dazzling light. In the narrow beam of his scope-mounted light, Sergeant Bentley saw the target's face contort with horror. Bentley took no notice of the man's frantic foreign shouting and watched his hands. He had to know if the target was armed. Stop waving your bloody arms about, he thought. And then, there it was, the gleam of black metal in the target's hands. Bentley's finger tensed on the trigger. But something wasn't right, something didn't add up. He shouted his warning again and glanced at the target's face. Did he match the photo they'd been shown? No, Bentley thought, it isn't him. And suddenly the stairwell light flashed into life. Bentley squinted into the light and the target brought his hand up in front of him, thrusting the black metal weapon toward him. And Bentley couldn't take the chance, couldn't risk the safety of his men. So he did what he had to do. He did the only thing. He could. High above them, standing helpless on the landing, Mark's dad buried his face in his hands and wept. Whew. Well, that was a long one. Um, thank you for bearing with me if you've uh, watched or listened to the end. If you would like to just uh, catch the slightly improved quality mp3 download i'll be putting that up on my website at mikeycampling.com and that will be available uh, totally free of course to subscribers the wonderful members of my subscribers club called the awkward squad and you can sign up there uh, by going to mikeycampling.com forward slash giveaway giveaways all one word see that I've run for almost 20 minutes for that story so it's a long time I think I only made up like one little goof or something 
and a little cough um, but I'll cut those out of the audio if I possibly can to enhance your listening pleasure so uh, there it is thank you very much just one of uh, stories one of the longer ones in a dark assortment so um, all with a bit of a dark tone uh, you know not perhaps the most cheerful story but in some ways when you read a dark tale of awful things happening you think well okay maybe my life isn't so bad you know maybe these dreadful things haven't happened to me and actually you know go off and hug a loved one and uh, have a smile have a glass of red wine and enjoy life so thank you very much for watching and listening uh, i've been mikey campling you've been you and that guy behind you no just kidding there isn't anybody okay um bye <laughs>